Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the Kolgormer of complexity and how it's used to prove the Gödel's incompleteness theorems. Um, so for the outline of my talk, first I'm going to go into what's the definition of Kolmogorov of complexity and a few examples to get you a feel of like how you could work it out. And then I'm going to move on to Chaitin's incompleteness theorem, which is one the major kind of result which I'm going to present today. And it's a very surprising result which kind of gives you a, some sort of like a complexity barrier on information. But it's kind of like a pseudo complexity barrier and I'm going to go more into that later on. Uh, then I'm going to move on to what the Gödel's incompleteness theorems are and provide some background on what's been done in this field. And then I'm going to present both of the theorems and um, proof sketches using uh, Chaitin's incompleteness theorem as like a starting point. Okay, so for the definition of Kolmogorov complexity, um, for any, basically any com uh, programming language that you choose, uh, the Kolmogorov complexity of a string is defined to be the length of the shortest program that prints that string. So, and the programming language that you choose is called the description language. That's just the term that we use. Um, so a, a good way to illustrate this is, uh, for example, this string, which is just 32 A's, is, doesn't seem super random. And you could easily see that a program which is based in Python, which you write pr print A times 32 would print the string. So in this case, the, uh, the program itself has a length of 12 characters. So you could say that the Kolmogorov complexity is at most 12. Uh, notice that I'm using at most here because I'm not uh, because you don't really like. I'm not sure if this is actually the shortest program in Python which does this. So there might exist a shorter program in Python which also prints this string. So uh, a random example would be if you have a very random string where you can. So in this string, there's no observable pattern if you assume that you're using the standard character set. So then, in this case, there's pretty much no good way of like compressing this information and being able to generate a program shorter, uh, or like a, being able to generate a short program which prints the string. So in this case, the way that I've used is just embedding the program inside, embedding the string inside the program. And then hence the total length of the program is 40 here. And notice that the, you can do this with any string. So the, there's like, this kind of gives you an upper bound on Kolmogorov complexity, which is the length of the string plus some constant value, which depends on the language that you use to print that string. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to what the Chaitin's incompleteness theorem is. So Chaitin's incompleteness theorem kind of talks about how complex a, like a string can be or how complex something can be. So there are a lot of examples of very highly complex things which actually are generated with very little information. So a very classic example that everyone gives is uh, the fractals generated from the Mandelbrot set which are very kind of intricate and contain a, bunch, a lot of detail. But like when you look at how they're generated, it's just like a few lines of code which does it. Um, another example which is not super common is uh, from the demo scene culture, which is a computer art subculture. So I have a video to show which kind of demonstrates what I'm talking about here. So, so this was a video generated by the demo scene community, which is quite kind of complex and it has like a lot of textures and, and it's, there's there's sound in the video as well and if you look and this and even though this video was generated in 2009 but the source code which generates this video is only about four kilobytes so you could see that this is a very very like intricate video to be generated by something so small but that's like a interesting fact and it's been, it, this has been a result of like a lot of kind of work in this field. So then a natural kind of question to ask is now that we have seen that you can generate very complex things using very little information, how complex can something actually be? So if you're talking about Kolmogorov complexity as we are here, the answer is actually that something can be arbitrarily complex. So. And the way to show it is like a very simple argument where if there was a maximal complexity that you can find, then there will be only a finite number of programs uh, under that length. So, but, so the fi finite number of programs means finite number of outputs. 
but you need to generate every string and there are an infinite number of strings, so you cannot have um, a maximal Kolmogorov complexity. And that means that there are things which have like arbitrarily a large Kolmogorov complexity. Okay, so then moving into the theorem itself. So the theorem kind of is counterintuitive. Um, it actually states that even though that we know that strings can have arbitrarily large complexity, there is actually a constant which exists, which depends on the language that we choose. Uh, for uh, and the property that the constant has that for that uh, for that constant, you can't actually show that a string has higher complexity than that constant. So, for example, if that constant is say uh, ten thousand, then for any string, you can't actually prove that that string has complexity more than ten thousand, even though that string may be millions of characters long. So, the core idea here is that even though we know we have a lot of like complex strings because we know there are infinitely many strings with arbitrarily large complexity, we can't actually show that any specific string has very high complexity. So like some technicalities just to point out before I go into the proof. Um, the constant L that the theorem kind of gives us doesn't just entirely depend on the language we choose because the result is talking about that that you can't prove something. And to talk about the, the fact that you can't prove something, you need to know the, the proof system in which you are actually talking about proving something. So the constant L also depends on the axiomatic system that we use to write our proofs. And um, another thing is that because we need, the, because we need that, that a computer should understand this axiomatic system, the axiomatic system should not be super complex and like super, unreasonable just to make the proof theorem fail. So that's the two kind of con constraints on the axiomatic system. Um, for most our intents and purposes, like any fairly common axiomatic system, like the basic arithmetic or ZFC, which is basically the language of math, is good enough here. Um, so okay, so moving on to the proof then. Um, so we start with the standard strategy of proof by contradiction. And we say that we, if you assume the opposite, then that's basically saying that for any number L, we have a string for which it's called, for, we have a string for which its complexity is more than that number. So if you choose any number N, then there exists a string S such that K of S is greater than N. But then this, we construct this pathological function, which um, when you look at it, it's kind of, uh, kind of doing what we want it to do. So um, given, when you give it this number n, it will print out the string s for which we have a proof uh, that uh, k of s is greater than n. So, so the way the function works is that it will loop through all the possible proofs in our system and a way to do it is just to look at all possible strings and then check if it's a proof or not or another way to do it is like using Google numbering, but that's kind of out of the context. Um, so, when, so when you know that you have a proof in S, you check if the proof is valid. So this, the first ch statement checks if the proof is syntactically correct, and the second statement checks if the proof is actually valid. And then the third statement actually just checks whether the proof that we have found proves, proves the thing that we needed it to prove. So we, we check if the proof P actually proves the statement ks is greater than n, and if the proof proves this statement, we just return the state. We just return the string s. And so this base, so this calling this function on a given value n will give us this s for which this statement is true. So, uh, so now, if we consider this function in an entire program, so this is the function that we were talking about. And this is the two helper functions that it used where for checking validity and checking that it's the right kind of proof. And then this is just calling that function for a specific value L. And I'm, go I'm gonna go into what L is later on. And then if you, if we define the length, if we not, not define, but if we count the length of these three functions in total and say that the length is U, and then say that the length of this, uh, this function call is k plus logarithm of L, and the logarithm of L comes from writing down L 
in characters. So if you write down L in binary, then it'll be the log base two of L, but if you write, the, write it down in decimal, then it'll be log base 10 of L. So then the total kind of length of the entire program is the length U plus the length K plus log L. So the length of the program is U plus K plus log of L. So now because we know that the logarithmic growth is much, much kind of smaller than uh, linear growth, we can always kind of find an L for which the L is greater than the length of the program itself. So because the logarithm, the logarithm grows very slowly, you can find such an L. And then, so when we find such an L, we just call this program PR for the value of L that we found. And then PR will run and then it will print out a string with, uh, print out a string say, the PR program, if the PR program prints out string S, oh. uh, it's if the PR program prints out string S, then we know that the Kolmogorov complexity of S is greater than L because that's what the function did. It gave, a, gave us a string S for which this thing was true. So, so, and we run it for L, so the string that we got out of the program has to have the property that k of, k, s, f, k of s of l is greater than l. But then here is a subtle contradiction here that because this, the, the, the program told us that k of, we can prove that k of s is greater than l, but the program itself is of length shorter than l. So if there's a program which prints l, then the Kolmogorov complexity of, print, of s is at most the length of that program. So we basically have that uh, the Kolmogorov complexity is provably greater than L, but because a shorter program prints it, its complexity cannot be greater than L. So that's the contradiction that we get. And that basically says that the assumption that this statement is provable for any N is false. So because this statement is provable for any N, there must be a uh, kind of an upper limit, uh, or not, not an upper limit, but there must be one, at least one finite integer for which this statement is true. Uh, that this that you, the, the statement that you cannot prove something like this is true. So now we're talking about, uh, so now that we've discussed that there is a number which is kind of like a maximal complexity for which you can't actually show that any string has more complexity than that number. The, so if we call it, so that number is L, so we'd like to uh, kind of know what the value of L actually is. So if we look at the proof here, the value of L kind of depended on U and K, but K was just the length of this small kind of function call. So K is kind of irrelevant and we only pretty much care about what the length U is. So, so the length U was the length of three total functions the is valid function, the proof function, and the higher complexity string function, which we defined here. So, so the length u, so we need three things to define what u is. We need a function which checks if a proof is syntactically correct. We, check, we need a function which checks if a proof is valid. And then we need a function which checks if the proof is like of the form that we want. So if the proof proves some a statement of this form. So, all of these things have been done and done before and the theorem prover can do all of these things. So it can check if a proof is syntactically correct and it can check if the proof is valid or not. And the next, the third part is also trivial to do. So, so given that it's kind of reasonable to assume that you can estimate the value of what L is because you can estimate the value of what U is. And Chaitan himself said that if you define, if you use Lisp as your uh, kind of description language for Kolmogorov complexity, then you can give an upper bound on L, which is two, three, five, nine plus N, and this N actually depends on the axiomatic system that you're using. So, uh, and, and in particular, N is the total length of the, your description of the axioms in the language. So, and for standard axiomatic systems, the description of all of the axioms is not more than a few thousand bits. So you can kind of estimate that the upper bound on L should be around 
10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5. And it's actually estimated for most languages that are relevant here. The value of L is 10 to the 4, which is actually fairly small. So this basically kind of is saying that if you, uh, you can't actually prove that for any string, its complexity is more than, say, uh, 10,000 bits. So uh, that's a very astonishing result. So now I'm going to move on to what the Gödel's incompleteness theorems are. And so, so Gödel's incompleteness theorems are very major kind of results in uh, mathematical logic and proof theory. So they kind of point out what the basic inherent limitations are in our in basic any formal system that we use that is powerful enough to do basic arithmetic. So they were first proved. They were first proved by Gödel in 1931, and the Gödel considered the very like standard paradox called the liars paradox, which basically considers the paradoxical statement: this statement is false. And Gödel considered a slight variation, which said this statement has no proof. And uh, after Gödel's proof, there have been multiple attempts and multiple successful proofs of both of the theorems using many different strategies. But it's still quite a controversial topic because it points out some major kind of limitations which a lot of people don't agree with. Um, the strategy, even the, the proof strategy that I'm going to present today is also kind of pretty new. And it was, I think it was proven in 2010, which, is, which shows that there's still a lot of interest and a lot of research still going on in the area. So for the first kind of incompleteness theorem, mm -hmm. The, the theorem statement is basically that the, any formal system that we have, which is capable of doing basic arithmetic, is incomplete. And so um, a small side note here is that the completeness, the concept of completeness that we are talking about here is slightly different to the concept of completeness that is presented in like part 1b, logic and proof. So the, here we are talking about something called syntactic completeness, where that, whereas the logic and proof course talks about semantic completeness and syntactic, syntactic completeness is a purely stronger kind of condition. So the theorem says that for any formal system, you, the, the, theor the system is always incomplete, so which basically means that the system has a few statements inside which are neither true nor false. And the system in general can, you can take any common major system. So you can take the piano arithmetic, which is basic arithmetic, or you could take that of C, in which pretty much all of math is done. So the proof is pretty much straightforward, and it kind of just follows from Shayton's incompleteness theorem, kind of just as a trivial consequence. So the, the theorem kind of asked us to find a statement which couldn't be, pro which couldn't be proved. And the the theorem, the Chaitin's incompleteness theorem kind of just gives us a statement that you can't actually prove that k of s is greater than l. So, so the proof kind of just follows because you, you found a statement in, our, in the system f uh, so that show, which cannot be proven in f, so uh, which can't be proven in f, so that basically means that uh, there are a few statements inside which, are, which can't be proven or disproven. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the second incompleteness theorem, which is slightly stronger than what the first incompleteness theorem says. And uh, in Gödel's proof, it was like a, a consequence of the first incompleteness theorem, but here we require just slightly more work. So, the um, so if you look at the if you look at any formal system, bit and you assume that the system is consistent, then Gödel's second incompleteness theorem says that you can't actually prove that your system is in, that, yeah, that, your proof, uh, that your system is consistent within that system. So it says that it basically means that if if you have a statement, uh, if you have a proof in your system, you can't actually uh, trust that proof because you don't know if your system is consistent or not. At least you can't tell if your system is consistent or not if you are just working within your system and you never go outside it. So again. The standard proof strategy, we start with a proof by contradiction. So um, we know by Chaitin's incompleteness theorem that there's this constant L for which we can't prove that k of x is greater than L. So this is basically saying that 
in the system F, we can't prove that K of X is greater than L. And so for the purposes of this proof, you're kind of moving away from strings and just looking at, in, uh, just looking at natural numbers because you can consider them as strings as well. And so if you take the X to be in this particular set, then it's, uh, then by Chaitin's incompleteness theorem, you can say that you can't actually prove this statement for any X in this set. But a thing to notice is that the size of this set is two to the L plus, two to the L plus one plus one, while there are only two to the L plus one minus one total programs of length less than or equal to L. So that means that there are a finite number of outputs that the finite number of programs can give you. So we are only considering programs of le length less than or equal to L. So that's a finite number of programs and that means that we have a finite number of outputs. So, but, uh, but we require the outputs to be numbers in this set. So, uh, but because we have more numbers and less outputs, there must be at least one number which hasn't been output by any of the uh, two to the L plus one minus one programs. So there's, so we call that specific number at M and so we know, what we know about M is that um, there is no program of length less than or equal to L which outputs M. So then the incompleteness, Chaitin's incompleteness theorem says that uh, this part can't be proven. So if you call this entire statement, including the F cannot prove K of M is greater than L, if we call the statement P, then within this statement, this thing is true, which says that we cannot prove this thing. Uh, so, but then as we just saw, if we, uh, because there were a finite, because L is a finite number and that means that there are a finite number of programs, by a process of elimination, you can eliminate all possible outputs and then find this specific number M for which there is no program. So, and because we are talking about finite numbers and a finite number of programs, this is uh, an enumerable proof that you can write and it's a valid proof by elimination. Uh, for the fact that K of, K of M has to have complexity more than L because we know that no program kind of prints, no program of length less than L will print M. So this statement must be true, but we also know by the incompleteness theorem that the, you cannot prove the statement to be true, but the proof of elimination is a valid proof. So we have just proven that this statement is true. So we've kind of shown that within F, you, you can prove the statement and you cannot prove the statement. So we, within F, you, you've kind of shown that P represents that you cannot prove the statement and not P represents that you can prove the statement. So within F, we have shown both P and the negation of P, which kind of uh, contradicts our assumption that F was consistent in the first place because the definition of being consistent is that uh, you can't prove uh, both the a statement and its negation. So this basically completes the proof for the second incompleteness theorem. So, so on to the conclusion. Um, so what we noticed here today was that even Kolmogorov complexity is a very kind of like interesting idea. And even though it's, it has a lot of uses in like fields like information theory, it can also be applied to many other fields and can also, and can lead to very kind of elegant and like surprising results. And what Chaitin's incompleteness theorem kind of gave us was a complexity barrier. Uh, in some sense, you can call it like a pseudo complexity barrier where you can't actually say that for any string, something is more complex than a complexity barrier. So, so you have a complexity barrier and you can't prove that anything is more complex than that. But, and then on kind of like an optimistic note, even because Gödel's incompleteness theorem can be interpreted as saying that are like the mathematical systems that we work in can't be trusted because you can't prove that they're consistent. Um, this, act, this result is not actually a surprise because if you could prove that, uh, that a system is consistent from within the system, then you can't actually tell if that proof is correct or not because if you assume that your system was inconsistent, then an inconsistent pr system can prove anything. So, uh, given an inconsistent system, you could prove that the system is consistent because an inconsistent system proves anything. So it should not be possible to prove consistency within the system. And 
it's a, and most of these systems that we work in, for example, the piano, basic arithmetic, um, have actually been proven to be consistent from outside the system. And there are some philosophical discussions there, but that's uh, beyond the scope of the talk. So yeah, this, these are my references, and uh, I'm gonna thank Matthew, Iwana, Jasper, and Professor Mingli from the University of Waterloo for helping me get uh, prepare the talk and like prepare my content. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.